visitors from outer space. They crash land without warning and can lie buried for thousands of years. Steve, here, I got one. Jeff Notkin and Steve Arnold live to unearth these space rocks. They are the meteorite Ooh. men. On this adventure, a rare event is caught on tape. Two fireballs are recorded on multiple sources and the guys spring into action to hunt for the valuable space rocks that just landed. It's literally money falling out of the sky. Steve races to Virginia. Where did it hit? It hit between the two dormers. I mean, it was like an explosion. Jeff heads to the brutal Sonoran Desert for pieces of the Tucson, Arizona fireball. Bad news, it's about 107 degrees. Then the guys drop everything and meet up in Texas to find very valuable meteorites from an extraordinary daytime fireball. Ah, there gotta be somewhere out there. Dude! Wow! <laughs> Remain on the current road. Meteorite hunting partners Steve Arnold and Jeff Notkin are embarking on what may be one of the toughest expeditions of their lives. We've got two substantial witness fireballs. Steve's out on the East Coast chasing his fireball, and I'm here in Arizona in my home state chasing our fireball. Witnessed fireballs are very rare. The vast majority of meteoroids burn up without anyone ever seeing them. When one is seen, or even caught on videotape, meteorite hunters and scientists converge on the location. With an extraordinary visual record, the value of a freshly fallen meteorite skyrockets. Witness falls are, are tied to a particular time and date in history. They, they have a unique quality. So witness falls command a high price on the collector's market. With two falls nearly 2,000 miles apart, Jeff and Steve split up to pursue what could be two huge paydays. If we're hunting on private property, we compensate the landowner with a percentage of what we find. We've joked with landowners a few times and said, it's literally money falling out of the sky. Money in the form of a meteorite did fall out of the sky on January 18th, 2010. A fireball was seen by thousands on the East Coast. But in the small town of Lorton, Virginia, just 17 miles from the White House in Washington, DC, doctors working in their offices didn't see a thing, but they heard it smashed right through their roof, crash landing in exam room number two. Yeah, it was, a, it was about the size of a mango. Dr. Chiampi and his partners have leased these offices for years. It was about this size, okay. and it was broken into maybe three or four pieces. So it was obviously going, you know more about it than I do. Sure, sure. Well, <laughs> it was going like 200 and something miles an hour. Probably between two and 300 miles an hour. And uh, that's going to have enough inertia that, yeah, it's definitely something that size uh, is going to punch. Punch a hole. So, so where did it hit? It hit between the two dormers. Probably okay. about uh, maybe a foot out, maybe halfway up the second dormer. OK. OK. Uh, and that's where it hit, and that's where the hole was. It actually went uh, through the uh, firewall and this in the, in the ceiling. Uh -huh. It hit the uh, carpeting and the cement. I mean, it was like an explosion. All right. And, and uh, the, uh, the owner of the building was very good. He got, he got somebody to fix the roof within a few hours. So OK. The hole was gone. So. This half-pound meteorite is very valuable and the debate over ownership started almost immediately. The doctors who leased the offices claimed the space rock is theirs and reportedly gave it to the Smithsonian for what would have been $5,000. The landlords say it's their building, their rock, and they'd like it back. All meteorites are worth money on the collector market. And a collector can be a museum, it could be a researcher, or it could be a private individual that's building a collection themselves. The ultimate value will be determined by supply and demand. If uh, there were only a few pieces, it would be worth 10 to $20 a gram. If it's the only piece, $50 a gram. If it's the only piece and it so happened to smash a building, $100 a gram. 300 grams, $100 a gram, it's a $30,000 rock. The space rock that invaded the doctor's offices and generated so much publicity is now valued anywhere from thirty to $50,000. But any meteorite that hits a man-made object is extraordinarily rare and worth big bucks. A mailbox in Georgia hit by a meteorite in 1984 
was auctioned off for $82,750. Just a few small pieces of that rock sold for $1,400 per gram. At 1,455 grams, the whole rock could fetch more than $100,000. Right now, I'm getting the GPS of, of as close as I can get to where this rock hit this building. And this is our bullseye. Steve starts to hunt for any more valuable pieces of the fireball that could have landed in the immediate area. Driving around looking seems a little unusual, but it's the best way to cover the most ground quick. Anything that's going to be in this neighborhood is going to be really close to the same size because we're not that far from the doctor's office. So um, I'm looking for a softball size, baseball size rocks on the curb, up, up on the sidewalk, between the cars. The search area gets narrowed down to about 18 inches along the curbs. And um, got word today there's some bad weather coming in probably tomorrow. So we are really under the gun to try to find something. The technical name for the stone meteorite that Steve's chasing is an ordinary chondrite. There are three types of meteorites, stone, iron, and stony iron. Most of these rocks originate in the asteroid belt, where subplanetary bodies smash into each other, breaking off into smaller pieces. These pieces, known as meteoroids, can hit Earth's atmosphere at speeds between 17,000 to 90,000 miles per hour. Their fiery entry lasts just a few seconds. Most of the time, they burn up completely from the 2,800 degree heat. If they survive, the pieces enter what is called dark flight. When they hit the ground at two to 300 miles per hour, the meteoroids get a new name, meteorites. Now, if it's a big piece, that's still enough to go right through your house or your head. But small meteorites, in most cases, will not make any kind of crater or impact pit on the ground. Out in Arizona, Jeff is chasing space rocks from a fireball caught on a home security system in a residential neighborhood in Tucson. Using the location and angle of the camera, Jeff determines the fireball's trajectory was roughly south to north over a desert area an hour southeast of Tucson. He enlists fellow hunters Suzanne, Lisa Marie, and Brad to triangulate the coordinates and help him search the vast target area. We saw the fireball in the video before that line. Are we on the top line or top on the line? Board? We've got a pretty good line on the direction of flight. The fireball came kind of over this way and what we've been trying to calculate is where it started to fragment and where some of those pieces might have fallen. So let's wrap everything up. Yeah. Now let's go find some meteorites. Okay, let's go. Finding meteorites is a lot harder than it sounds. If they're out there, the meteorites have a distinctive black fusion crust caused by their burning entry into Earth's atmosphere. Oh, I just saw a black rock. I thought I'd just stop and check it out. You never know. We have seen them on the road before. <laughs> it's a gear shift handle. Well, it was very black. That looked kind of like a meteorite sitting on the side of the road. That's a keeper. One of my meteor wrong. Jeff and his team head for location number one, their prime target area. Meteorites found just after a fresh fall are worth two or three times more. Anything recovered now would be worth a fortune. We're right in the zone where we want to be. This is the area where we feel meteorites might have fallen. And we've just come across a big sign that says not public land. No trespassing fines will be assessed. So we're just checking our maps to see if there's another way through. We don't want to trespass on anyone's land, especially out here. And especially when you see bullet holes in the sign, it's kind of a good idea not to fall around without permission. There are some roads that head off east. There should be a road that goes off to the right. Sometimes we stand around and talk a little bit too much. The Why road not? we need to be on yep. is I think it'd back up this way. I think we're spending too much time on these details. We haven't actually done any hunting at all today. We can either go back and just I think we need to start spreading out, looking around. If we don't find anything, move one way or the other. But we could just look at the map all day, and we're definitely not going to find anything just from that. 
Let's go find some space rocks. Yes, please. Yeah. Let's go. Just after noon, they settle on location number two, public land south of the private ranch, but directly in line with the flight path of the fireball. Of all the gentlemen that you... Grab a truth. Damn it. This is ideal hunting ground. It's, uh, it's hard, dry, flat. There's very little vegetation. That's the good news. The bad news is it's about probably 106 or 107 degrees, I'd say. Wow, that looks uncomfortably like a meteorite, but isn't. Yeah, I was really happy for a minute. It's magnetite. <laughs> I know. Wow. Well. I like this out here, and I th it might be worth coming back here, I think, and, and hiking it out, but we've got pretty heavy rain potentially going to hit us, and it's sort of close to the end of the day. A thunderstorm, or gully washer as the locals call it, is brewing in the mountains nearby and could flood the roads. On their way out, the team spots a very promising black rock just off the road. Uh, no trespassing. Oh, yeah. Bush, bush. Yeah. See the little, little bush <laughs> sitting up like this? See the big midway up the hill. Yep. I, don't know. I tried it with binoculars, I couldn't tell. I don't really think so. I'll try it with my binoculars as well. I think it's unlikely, but I'd kind of like to know either way. <laughs> oh, it looks like just a it's just a clump of grass, isn't it? Is that what he saw from the, from the road? It's just a plant. It was a really weird plant. It was about this big and it was extremely dark. Really? You gotta follow up every lead. You never know when one of these is gonna turn into something. This is what most really days are like. We go out and we hunt and we don't find anything. Get used to days like this because there are a lot of them. <laughs> oh, it's Steve. Arizona Department of Meteorites. How are things out there? Well, it's a little frustrating. We've got all this really good intel, but it would take us a year to hunt a square mile out on this. It's just ridiculous. It's so rocky and brushy out here. It's tough going. I think we're going to head back. Hey, I got this idea. I've got the time blocked off. Why don't we go to uh, the west? Yes, West Texas. There's got to be something left. I got a good feeling. Excellent. OK, see you in Texas. OK. Thanks, Steve. Bye. The toughest part of meteorite hunting is making the decision to end a hunt without finding space rocks. There is always a hesitation. Is this going to be a good one? Is it a bad one? Do we go? Do we stay? Do we wait? Sometimes it all just comes down to a hunch. Steve and Jeff meet up in the small town of West Texas. Population, less than 3,000. These farmlands became the center of the meteorite universe on February 15, 2009. On that day, the cameraman was filming a marathon. There was a spectacular daytime fireball captured on camera by fluke that hardly ever happens. There was probably 50 or 60 meteorite hunters that showed up. Hunters from around the world arrived to track down these valuable space rocks. Uh, within an hour, I was en route to Texas. We averaged over 20 miles a day. And I got the worst blisters, and it was cold, and then it was wet. Steve ended up being the single most successful hunter of anyone that came out to West. I think he found 32 stones himself. Jeff found 13 specimens, and they'll be in his collection till the day he dies. Ah, there got to be some more out there. I'm sure there's some more out there. It's been seven months since the guys first hunted meteorites around West Texas. When they were last here, they found at least $65,000 worth of space rocks and are convinced they left a lot behind.
Well, here we are. The plan is to hunt locations they couldn't get to on their first trip. We still need to get permission from a couple people. Getting onto private property means gaining the trust of the local landowners. And let's see about getting some permission on a couple of these other Jeff knows Steve has the gift of gab for these parts. Steve speaks the language of the guys in these rural places. He grew up in Kansas, and he just manages to connect with these people, and they immediately like him, and then they want to let him go and traipse all over their land, and it's great. We are needing to do a little bit of looking. Shook the ground and rattled the windows and everything really? else. Yeah, OK. <laughs> Would it be all right if we took a took a little look yeah. on there? Go ahead and take a look. All right with you if we have a chance to hunt? Yeah, it'd be fine with me. Oh, appreciate it. Well, appreciate it. OK. Appreciate your time. OK. Thank you, sir. Appreciate it. Thank you all. See you later. <laughs> Thanks. In order to hunt their first location, three miles from the town of West Texas, right in the path of the strewn field, the guys have to secure one last permission from Don and Wanda Adair. This ground from, I guess, this road back is your property? Exact property lines are critical in meteorite hunting. The law states that if a meteorite lands on your property, you own it. A little stock like the fence right there, that's what I'm talking about. Right. That pasture. Don't okay. want to be out here in, in this green stuff. Before they set foot on the Adair's land, the guys settle on the terms of the deal. Anything we find, we're gonna we're gonna show it to you, and with your permission, we're we're gonna offer it up for sale, and we're gonna split everything we make 50-50 with you. Does that sound okay. like a fair deal? Okay. Um, I got my wife here this morning. She, oh. Okay. She's, she's been with me for a long time. She's half interested in here too. Okay. Very All good. Right. We're gonna we're burning daylight, so we're gonna try to go find us something. Thank you again, sir. I'm headed up there. This, that's the good spot, I think, and I want to get up there before Steve does. Not that we're competing or anything. Where did Jeff go? I guess he's way over there. Well, he didn't waste any time taking off. For this hunt, the guys go low tech, using just sticks with high-powered magnets attached. The Ash Creek meteorites are L6 chondrite. There is about 20% iron in these. The magnet will attract the rock to it. We're almost perfectly in line on this spot. Would have gone right overhead, up towards those hills, hopefully dropping. I always want to go you that way. You always want to so go that way, yeah. It was <laughs> there. <laughs> no wonder I didn't find anything up there. I was something up there. The fireball that streaked over this farmland was dubbed the West Texas Fireball. When a new meteorite is recovered, falls, discovered, it is typically named after the nearest town to the point of discovery. To be very specific, the nearest post office. The naming of meteorites isn't casual. The official naming organization is called the Nomenclature Committee. In the case of the Ash Creek meteorite, the first two pieces were found next to a small stream called Ash Creek, and the request was put to the nomenclature committee that it be named after the creek rather than the town. And that's what happened. So this is the famous Ash Creek, after which the meteorite takes its name. I wasn't really expecting it to be so deep. <laughs> it was going to be like a little stream. Often, the best place to find meteorites is right where they were found before. Amateur hunters can miss big finds. <sighs> Just mud, muddy stuff. That probably wasn't the best idea of my career. Oof. The things we go through for meteorites. Of course, if you're in Texas, you're in cattle country. Most of these farms have large herds that have been trampling this ground for months. What's a little discouraging right here is, is that we see a lot of cow hoof prints, which means there could have been a meteorite, and the cow could have stepped on it and punched it right down and in. Can you believe how much noise those cows make? Quiet! I'm trying to study. What are you looking at? I'm getting hungry for steak. <laughs> Piece of junk. Well, it's a rock. It's not junk, but... See how black that stone is there? I thought that was one, but it's not. Stick to a magnet. 
That's what we're looking for. I can hear them calling. They're calling. They're somewhere. Or maybe that's the cows calling. That is so mean. I saw that black rock from about 20 feet away, just sitting there on the surface, just like it should be. But it's not real. It's just, it's just an ordinary earth rock. I'll probably find it again now and go through the same thing. We come out here and search for meteorites because it's what we want to do. It's what drives us. A bad day meteorite hunt beats a good day in the office. The odds are against us, but we haven't given up yet. The plan to get the Adair's permission to search this previously off-limits farm in location number one suddenly pays off. Steve, here, I got one. You got what? <laughs> I've got one meteorite. You lucky dog. There's no luck involved, it's skill. It was a compliment. Oh, my. Dude! I, I walked by it and I thought, it would be funny if that was a meteorite. I didn't think it was, actually. I went back and looked at it a second time. Wow, it sticks, but not by much. Look at that. That's a nice shape, isn't 100 it? 100% crusty. Meteorites are my great passion in life. They're the most interesting things in existence, as far as I'm concerned. There you go. Way to go, partner. Congratulations. Thanks, partner. First one, and she's a beauty. Steve pulls out a stone from their earlier hunt to compare. Oh, look at that. Weathered. Yeah. Quite a lot of rust. I didn't think it would be that, that terrestrialized yet. And this is much larger than any of the other ones that I found. That's actually my biggest. Ash Creek stone, so pretty excited about that. And west, 97.00360. This is our official marking. We got it. So we got it logged. It's, it's half persistence, half luck, half skill, right? That's one and a half. That's it. OK. That's what it takes. <laughs> Part of it is I think you get excited when you find something, but also I think you're kind of vindicated, and you go, well, well we are hunting in the right place. There are still pieces out here. Yeah. Finding this meteorite on the eastern edge of location number one indicates that the plan to re-hunt land that was off limits just after the fall is a good one. This is probably the second best bit of land, right? Well, yeah. There's, there's this section, and then there's a little section down there that we think has never been hunted, and we're going to try and get permission to go down there. But uh, when one of our colleagues asked for permission there in February, he was chased off the property with a shotgun. <laughs> Well, wow. Oh, well done. Steve is always trying to find the most high-tech, amazing device. He always has a different thing to go, this is the best magnet cane. Now I've really got the best one. Look, it's collapsible. Look, it floats. I like to go uh, organic, and every hunt that I go on, I try and find a perfect dead tree branch. It seems to be somehow in tune with the Earth, and maybe will even guide me to the next meteorite that lies skulking under some long grass. We'll have the war of the magnet canes. Ah! Look, you almost ripped my magnet off, you fiend. You didn't rip my <laughs> magnet off. <laughs> well, that's because mine's organic. It's sensitive to the local meteorite population. All right, we'll see. To focus their search, Steve and Jeff head off to talk to a witness, Willie Supak, whose 54-acre farm they'd also like to hunt. Working in my garden, and I heard the boom, and I looked up, and there's a little bit of smoke. And, OK. And I didn't know what it was. I thought maybe an airplane or something blew up. Then later on, well, I heard that it was immediate, right? You, you got to see the event, and we're, we're right in the middle of the, of the zone here where, where pieces uh -huh. are supposed to have fallen back off down in that corner, and then there was another one back off over there. OK. We're hoping that, you know, you wouldn't mind if we had a chance to come out and take a look and maybe find something that's still hiding out. Might, I don't know. <laughs> you all, all right with you if we have a chance to hunt? Yeah, it'd be fine with me. I oh, appreciate it. So we have permission to hunt this section here. Yeah, and... right in. Right in here. Well, I cannot believe that this area has been thoroughly searched. It's it's just too rough. I like doing things the hard way, so let's start at the hardest part instead of the easiest part. Okay. 
After several hours of searching on Willie's property, Steve has spotted something interesting. Jeff, come here. What have you got? Does your magnet stick onto that? That doesn't look like one. Ah! Uh, wow. I found a good wrong as well. Look at that. I saw that in the ground. And it looked like shiny fusion crust, but it doesn't stick to a magnet no, either. No, it doesn't. Well, part of the challenge is, is trying to figure out how much these have, may have rusted since we yeah, were here last. Yeah, I, I was just wondering that. I was well, figuring they're going to be brownish now. The longer a meteorite lies on the surface of the Earth, the more it becomes contaminated by terrestrial elements, oxygen, water. That's why meteorites should be recovered quickly after the fall. They will decay, they will rust, and over time decompose and fall apart, and there will be nothing left. It's just kind of amazing. You start walking, and you look up an hour later, and you can be a couple miles away from where you were. Catching the West Texas fireball on videotape was pure luck, but catching it on Doppler radar was a scientific breakthrough. Doppler radar normally tracks weather, but it has the potential to pick up meteorite falls. Greetings, gentlemen. The guys could someday use this technology to find thousands and thousands of dollars worth of meteorites. We actually have a, an image here of the meteorite that was collected on radar. What are we seeing there? Is, is that the fireball? Is that the smoke trail? It's falling debris at this point. Oh, really? So these radars aren't made to look for meteorites. They're made to look for weather. So they, they look close to the ground, basically. And so by the time you're seeing meteorite debris, falling meteorites on this, they've already slowed down. They're already falling straight to the ground. The way the radar operates, it's, it's, a, it's on a pedestal, and it, and it rotates at a certain speed. And as it rotates around, it then changes elevation angles, goes up again, rotates around, and up again. Basically, the stuff is falling like a curtain, and the radar sweeps past every six minutes or so, right. and it'll just sweep out a, a slice through. And you have to go through and, and, and piece them all together to see what was falling where and, and the pattern. The larger pieces will take 60 seconds, two minutes to reach the ground. The, the very fine stuff can take up to 30, 40 minutes. You have to catch it during a window of just really a few seconds in order to get any information at all. Is that correct? It's a game of luck, a game of chance, but there's also an awful lot of radars out there. The West Texas fireball was a breakthrough. This was the first time scientists could identify the unique signature that a meteorite fall makes on Doppler radar. This one was really the pivotal one. We were able to, to see for the first time what should this look like so that we know what yeah. to start looking for in other falls. We could easily double the number of fresh fallen meteorites available for science every year. You're going to give us a call next time this happens, right? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and then you're welcome to come out in the field with us. Yeah. Armed with fresh intel, Steve and Jeff head out to hunt location number two, yep. just slightly north, another piece of property that was off limits seven months ago. Dude! Wow! The fact that Jeff and Steve already found a $2,000 rock in an area supposedly tapped out is encouraging. To find more meteorites, the guys talk to people like Jim, Diane, and Amber with significant finds to their credit. She actually found one. You got a meteorite hunting family there. That's pretty good. <laughs> we didn't know one of the part. few. <laughs> Are these the rocks? Yeah. You mind if I look at them? Wow. Beautiful little rock. This is the second one that hit the bottom. And you look how black the wow. fusion crust And little thumbprints in it. We have an expression in, in the meteorite world. When, when a meteorite hits something that's man-made, uh -huh. like a house or a mailbox or a car, they're called hammer stones. Mm -hmm. Hammer stones. And, and they're, they're, pretty, they're pretty few of them. Yes. Yeah. So uh, if you ever decide you want to sell that, we'll hook you up with a buyer <laughs> that will pay you big bucks We've for it. We've had lots of people. I yeah. bet you have. <laughs> in 2003, a five-pound hammerstone that hit a house outside Chicago later sold for more than $50,000. Just the windowsill, closet door, and piece of roof it hit sold for $2,700. The only person ever hit by a hammerstone didn't hit pay dirt. On November 30th, 1952, Ann Elizabeth Hodges was asleep on her couch. A meteorite crashed through her ceiling, bounced off a radio, and hit her on her side. 
That space rock went to the Alabama Museum of Natural History. Okay. The path where we found the majority of them were kind of like at an angle, because I found... Like Jeff and Steve extract as much information as possible from the meteorite hunting family. And the smaller one that I found was across the creek bed on the other side, closer, closer to the fence. Where yeah, the road closer runs. to the road. Location number two is a field about six miles farther north, but still directly in the strewn field path. Based on the family's finds, there should be more space rocks, hopefully big ones. So that was the origin point, and over there is the barn that was hit. Not sure what that is, but from five or 10 feet away, it, it can fool you. You get up close to it and you realize it's not, so. For every meteorite, there are hundreds of meteor wrongs. I'm gonna be bending up and down way too much. I say we grit it a little bit. I hate gritting. Gritting is when you go up and down in nice little rows. If you're searching, oh, say, you know, five feet, six feet Steve's wide. gritting demonstration will take an hour. Steve, could you go into a little more detail for and people who have just tuned in? Sorry. I'm going to give you my own explanation of gritting. Gritting is the most boring part of meteorite hunting. Gridding is the scientific method of dividing up a quadrant into a grid pattern that can be searched in methodical detail. The wandering haphazardly around is much more fun, and that's just the way I'm going to play it today. <sighs> OK, I'm going to grid, and Jeff can meander, and, and we'll, we'll just see who finds the biggest and the most rocks. This is just about exactly where I want to be. We're in a straight line from the path of the fireball. And as we go in this direction, we expect pieces to be larger. Oh. Oh, another wrong. This is about the right size for up here. Put your magnet on it, it doesn't stick, but you still feel compelled to bend over and pick it up anyway, knowing it can't be one. It's also the Latin name is a leverite meaning you leave her right there. You're hunting in a strewn field like this. We're not finding anything. Is it because nothing fell on this section? Or possibly hidden in the plants? We don't really know. Well, I guess this is the property line. It's as far as we go on this track. Let's go, Hop. Let's find us a meteorite. That's right, fetch us a meteorite. With such a massive area to hunt, the guys need another set of eyes and a nose to help find meteorites. They enlist Ruben Garcia and his dog, Hopper. Ruben's a fellow meteorite hunter who also hunted here just after the fall seven months ago. When he was last here, Ruben stumbled upon a space rock just walking up onto a lady's front porch. And she said, you mean that black rock that our dog Hopper dragged to the porch and dropped? What are your theories about how she came to pick up the rock and drop it on the porch? The first is Hopper actually saw the stone as it fell and decided to play intergalactic fetch. The other theory I have is since a new fall will have a particular smell, Hopper may have walked over to it because of the smell, picked it up, and found it interesting for that reason and brought it back to the porch. It wasn't the first time Hopper had dragged unusual things up onto the porch. A lot of those things happened to belong to the neighbors. And in fact, there was at least one neighbor that took shots at her. But then she brought home the meteorite. The dog saved the meteorite, and the meteorite saved the dog. What kind of value is added when it is the only known meteorite in the world that's been recovered by a dog. It's going to be worth a lot more than a regular uh, Ash Creek stone of this size. Reuben negotiated for a collector who paid $1,000 for Hopper's meteorite. That same rock is now worth between seven dollars to $10,000. But Reuben got the best deal of all. He adopted Hopper. And you take her out hunting? She goes out meteorite hunting with us. She hasn't found another stone since West. Yet. Yet. The guys and Hopper head out to the untouched land of location number two. Come on, Hopper. If you've done it once, you can do it again. We have the utmost faith in you. What 
Well, if there's one here, we're going to find it. I promise you that. Every once in a while, it pays to look up. About every other tree has a hornet's nest on it. Oh. This tree's got three in it. Oh, God, yeah. You got to watch where you go here. There are hornet's nests everywhere. We're taking turns looking down for meteorites, and we're taking turns looking up for wasp nests. So you go to move a branch, and there's a wasp nest on it. And there's got to be some meteorites in there. Oh, there's a big one up there. Yeah, yeah they're Yikes. all over. Ah, another one. I don't want to have anything to do with that. Another one. Got one there, one there, one, oh! one there. Ah! It's kind of tough. It's what you got to do. Whew. Those uh, hornets are bombarding me. I'm sticking close to the dog. She knows what she's doing. Boy, if my memory serves me right, it was a little bit easier last time. Been out here for hours. After a long day of wasps, heat, and hiking, the guys wrap up the hunt. Location number two yields nothing. So far, they only have one space rock worth about $2,000 to show for their efforts. Morning brings a new challenge, rain. Walking the fields is gonna be tough. West Texas starts with a ritual. Well, the first ritual is to create the blisters. And then every day afterwards, you got to try to protect them. I should have put this on to start with. Despite the thunderstorm, there's one last place they're determined to hunt, location number three. Clarence Yonick's 552-acre farm is directly across from where they found many of their rocks in February. But they couldn't get access then due to the masses of meteorite hunters in the area. I'm going to check up in here. It's damp, gray, rainy. Now I remember why I moved to the States. The rain makes things a little bit harder. Uh, you slip around. There's standing water that you can't walk in. You can't see what's there. So a little bit distracting. I'm reasonably sure that no one's hunted this little bit right here. There's more here. I know it. Oh, they're taking off now. Oh, I scared them. I'm a vegetarian. He's the one you want to worry about. We've got Hitchcock's the birds on the west end and attack of the killer cows on the east end. <laughs> and they say nothing happens in rural Texas. Uh, <laughs> oh, what price is too high to pay? Look at my boots, really. I mean, have you ever seen anything as obscene as that? Why would you put yourself through it? Nobody makes me do this. You know, I'm not serving a prison sentence or anything. Get lost. What are you moaning about? Oh, some bees or something bothering me. Well, I don't know what, what's worse. A bee bothering you because you eat honey or a cow bothering me because I eat cow. But we don't kill the bees in order to get the honey. Well, that's true. They're handsomely compensated for their work. The beekeepers build them those fancy bee houses to live in. Oh, I just opened a Pandora's box. He's going to go on and on and on. It's very artistic. I'm just going to go look way over here. They're architects and engineers. The cells they build are perfect little hexagons. But Jeff, I can't hear you. Stack them one on top of each other and, and fabricate these beautiful hives. Ooh, don't tell Jeff. He'll get mad. I killed one of his buddies. The guys are confident they're right on top of big space rocks, but frustration mounts. We're getting at the end of our expedition, and so it's like if we're going to find something, we've got to find it pretty quick. I cannot believe that there are none in this field. It doesn't make any sense. There's another wrong. It certainly sense. looks like the, col the color is right, but the shape is weird. You start to just crack up a little bit after you've been out here for a long time doing this. <sighs> what we want to hear is that little click. A little stone just jumps onto the magnet. It makes me very happy.
Chef! I'm busy. Chef! Chef! Look what I found! I told you they were down here. Excellent. How cute is that? Oh, wow. Wow, it's really not that oxidized. Isn't it's that not. surprising? Pretty black, but but there's definitely some splotchiness. A bit, but I was expecting them to be much more orangey than that. Woohoo! Well done. You look on a map and you say there ought to be something there, and you go there and you find something. Nice. So makes it all worth the while. So Jeff, this one is maybe three grams. Yours was 37. Uh, that yeah, 37.8. Between the two of us, we were averaging about 20 grams. I didn't yeah. realize I was doing so good. The way I see it is more like I'm finding 10 times as much as you are. No, it's it's more like you found one and I found one. Oh, I see. Oh, OK. There are 15 square miles. It didn't take a lifetime to cover it all. So we made our dent and uh, uh, came, came out with a couple of nice specimens. It was tough finding these two, but we found them. Final haul. Two meteorites, 37.8 grams, worth almost $2,000, and three grams, worth around $150. Steve and Jeff take their finds to the campus of UCLA to verify that their rocks match other Ash Creek meteorites. Dr. Rubin. Dr. Alan Rubin, a top geochemist, is the scientist who first classified the Ash Creek meteorites. The guys sent Steve's rock ahead to be cut, analyzed, and compared to one of the meteorites scooped up right after the fall. I have the original stone that was given to me just a couple of days after its fall. Uh-huh. And you can see okay. the very nice fusion crust on it. And that must be fairly unusual for you to receive a freshly fallen stone that soon after the event. Yes, it's um, almost never happened. If we recover a rock years after it landed, then the material in the rock have undergone terrestrial weathering, and the minerals are no longer exactly the same composition as before. So we want to get a rock as quickly as possible after it's fallen. We were quite amazed at the degree oh, of weathering in seven months. Where the rainwater gotten in, and they made all these little fractures. You can see the dramatic difference. To analyze the chemical composition of the rocks, Dr. Rubin uses thin sections so sheer they're almost transparent. So I'm going to take these things, uh, these thin sections, which I've mounted in these metal holders, and I will put them on a holder here in the electron microprobe X-ray analyzer, latch it, and pump it down. As this is an electron gun, we shoot a beam of electrons at the sample when the sample gets into the chamber. Um, and we essentially excite the atoms uh, inside the various minerals in here, which emit x-rays of particular energy. I'm just going to nod my head and pretend I know what you just said. So. OK. So, so basically, we're going to find out what the minerals are by looking on the screen? But we'll find out the compositions of the minerals. By comparing the two thin sections side by side, Dr. Rubin can see if Steve and Jeff's rock is from the West Texas fireball. And so here we're beginning to get an, an image of it. The white grains here are metal. Uh, these lighter gray uh, grains here are olivine. We see that it has about 22.8% of the iron oxide component in the mineral olivine. The composition of this olivine here is identical to the uh, mean composition of the olivine in the Old Ash Creek. And it's an excellent olivine analysis. The two finds are indeed Ash Creek meteorites. Despite their appearance, the interiors of these four and a half billion year old rocks are in surprisingly good shape. They've barely been affected by their time on Earth. One could say that the study of meteorites gives us the opportunity to look through a window to the early days of the formation of the solar system. By looking at rocks like this, we can begin to piece together uh, how the asteroids formed, uh, how the solar system formed, and uh, we're going back uh, learning where we came from, which is one of the basic questions of all of science. Where science meets commerce in the meteorite world is the Tucson Gem and Mineral Show. Space rocks are bought, sold, and traded for prices ranging from 10 bucks to hundreds of thousands of dollars. Now, all the hard work and long hours literally pay off for the guys. Steve is selling rocks from his West Texas collection. It's a place where people can 
put their hands on something. And when you get to compare side by side, oh, I like, and especially meteorites, there's some little nuances that um, it, it, a lot of people like to come and physically examine, compare, compare prices, compare size, that kind of thing. Buy, sell, trade, barter, it's, it's, it's fun. These are them. These are the West Texas meteorites, what I have left of them. Yeah. I found quite a few West Texas meteorites, and so that was one of the things in my inventory. Now, I sold quite a few. I still have some inventory, so I'm coming here. Uh, this is the first big show since the fall, so, you know, it, it's an opportunity for people to, to examine these uh, in person, and, um, and I've got some to show them. So that would have broke right at the very end of the burning, just enough to just toast it a little bit. But oh, yeah, there's some roll over around mm -hmm. the edge there, just around where it... The, what is this one with the second fusion crust? How much is that one? 47, 13.5 grams, 55 a gram, $742. Yeah, that's a candidate. Let's think about that okay. one. And yeah, I really like this one. Let me take a look at it. I didn't really look at okay. it. Let me take a look. Did you find this one? Yes. I did. So that makes it more interesting to me. I think this is the one. You like that one? Yeah, I like that one a lot. All right. Jim had a price range and, and a type. He was interested in 100% crusted stone. $792. His price range was about six to $800, and uh, happened to find one at the top of his price range that he really liked. The one I picked had a nice shape. It wasn't just a flat block of rock. It had projections and points and things on it. And it was fully crusted, didn't have any defects in the fusion crust. Daylight fireball. Yeah. Everything's perfect on this. This is, this is as good as it gets. It was one that Steve, Steve actually found himself. So that made that stone more important. There you go. Lot. Thanks a lot, Steve. Always a pleasure. He was happy. He got his rock, I got a pile of money, and we both go our separate ways. And I got a little bit of money, I can fund the next expedition, hopefully find another one and come back and sell it to Jim or to someone else next time. <laughs>